In 2001, my only daughter, Laura, was killed in a rampage shooting while home on winter break from college. She was shot four times at point blank range and died instantly. Laura was bright and beautiful at age 19. She had extraordinary kindness, capability, and spirit. She was an outstanding student, graduating as high school valedictorian, and at the time of her death was a sophomore at Haverford College and in the midst of her campaign for the student body presidency. Laura was already living a life full of service. She had unlimited possibilities and the brightest of prospects. All that suddenly ended because of a gun in the wrong hands. Hi, my name is Rithika Iyer. I joined the gun violence prevention movement because people are dying from preventable situations. From suicide to everyday acts of gun violence to mass shootings, there's legislation and community-based organizations that are working and actually solving this problem. I feel very empowered by Team Enough and by Brady because as I learn and lobby for intersectional gun violence prevention measures. Hi, I'm Griffin Dix with the Oakland Brady Chapter. My son Kenza was killed by a boy who got his father's handgun and thought he unloaded it. I learned that the gun lacked a prominent chamber loaded indicator. So I'm especially interested in handgun safety standards. In California, thanks to the Brady Chapters, we passed laws setting handgun safety standards and brought down the rate of unintentional gun death by two thirds. Hi, my name is Antonelle Borjas. I'm a junior in high school and an advocate for gun safety with March for Our Lives. As a student, not only do I fear for my life constantly, I know countless of students that do as well. In 2019, a classroom of 34 students were injured due to gun violence per week. My goal is to implement safe storage laws so that's keeping kids and teens like me safe in schools and preventing countless of homicides and suicides. Thank you. Hi, welcome to When Guns Are in the Home, safe gun storage and gun violence prevention tools for people in crisis. My name is Pelly Anderson. I'm currently a member of the Northern California Regional Leadership Council for Brady. I previously was a prosecutor working most of my career as a domestic violence lead. Since joining the gun violence prevention movement, I worked to bring gun violence restraining order training to Marin and Sonoma County law enforcement agencies. I'd like to introduce the rest of our panel for this session. Julia Weber. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm Julia Weber. I serve as implementation director for Giffords Law Center here in San Francisco. And I've worked on uh, violence prevention efforts for over 25 years, focusing largely on domestic violence, work with the courts, uh, policy development, training, and education. And um, I'm really pleased to be here. And thank you for the powerful video. I, I work on this issue because of too many losses in my own life as a result of gun violence and also for those mentioned in the video and for so many people I haven't known. So thank you for this. Christian. Hi, everybody. I'm Christian Heine. I'm the Vice President of Policy at Brady. Um, I come to this movement like uh, so many uh, people who are, who are on this call right now. Um, in 2005, my parents were um, shot. My mom was killed in a really awful incident in Southern California. Um, very fortunate that my father survived. The group that we turned to and, and the place where I was able to find my voice as an advocate was right here at Brady. So. It's a real honor in my life to be able to represent Brady on our um, our policy initiatives and and uh, both in the in the states uh, where we have seen such incredible progress, especially here in California, where where my roots are, um, as well as in uh, national politics as well and and in Capitol here at Capitol Hill in Washington D.C. 
really excited about the conversation to be joined by such wonderful panelists here. And, and thank you, Kelly, for leading the conversation. And Kai Hunter. Hi, thank you so much, Pelly. And it is so exciting to be back with the Brady family again. Um, as many of you know, I am the inaugural Sarah Brady Fellow and the former VP of Programs for Brady and um, have gotten involved, I think, for a little bit of different reasons. Um, I'm a Marine, like clearly I'm in my URA office right now, so you're just gonna have to deal with all of the, uh, the Marine Corps stuff, but been around guns my entire life. And so really had a passion to bring gun owners into this conversation because um, we know that with more guns than people out there, that if we're going to get to the root of this problem um, and really solve the epidemic of gun violence in our country, we need to be able to engage those people who bring guns into their home. And that's really today what I'm, I'm so excited to talk about as part of this is what are some of the things that we can do uh, both from a personal perspective that I'll talk about a little bit more and also some of our policy solutions to address gun the risk that guns pose when they come into the home. And so I think with that, if we could kick off the presentation and I'll jump right in. Okay, so welcome, When Guns Are in the Home, Safe Storage and Violence Prevention Tools for People in Crisis. This is something that is a incredibly timely topic given the moment we're in, in this global pandemic. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit of the things that you can do as a gun owner or a non-gun owner to address this issue. Next slide. And here's us, so we're excited to be with you. Um, all right, so I'm going to start off talking about End Family Fire, a program that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but want to dig into what we just launched around suicide and some of how this is even more critical in this moment of the global pandemic. Next slide. So if we think about what End Family Fire is really about, it is getting to the crux of some of the biggest problems that uh, we are facing in this country today with regards to gun violence. And more importantly, doing it in a way that unites Americans and is an easy inroad for us to talk about, diffusing some of these really hard political conversations. I think right now we're really understanding how tough a lot of conversations are and Family Fire is a tool to have hard conversations in a way that will fundamentally move the needle. Just as a refresher, Family Fire refers to a shooting involving an improperly stored or misused gun that is found in the home. And this is intentionally broad to be able to include unintentional shootings, suicides, and even homicides. You know, basically any time a gun is found in the home and, and misused. I like to say, people always ask me, you know, when will you think that we've prevented gun violence? They say when any gun brought into the home for a legitimate purpose is never used for something other than that. And that's what End Family Fire is getting at. And when we think about kids, it's really a very important inroad to think about this conversation. And there are two primary vectors that End Family Fires talks about with regards to kids. Unintentional, sh unintentional shooting of kids, as well as homicide or suicide. And talking about kids and using kids is a very important vehicle because we have found through our research and through focus groups that even the most ardent Second Amendment supporters out there, the ones who are the cold dead hands folks, break down and get a little softer when you start talking about kids. And they start to recognize that their actions actually pose real risks and want to learn more about how to take action to prevent those risks. And safe storage is the big key here that that simple action can save several lives. Next slide, please. And so why is this an issue? If we think about unintentional shootings, every day, eight kids are injured or killed by guns that are found in the home. That's a staggering statistic. If you think about if eight kids were injured or killed from just about anything else, I mean, it takes 
one, maybe two, uh, and they change huge policies on bringing peanut butter into schools or having kale that's uh, around there. You know, like, so, so this is something that is on a scale of multiple, multiple magnitudes compared to other things that are, are facing our children today. We also know that there are 4.6 million kids out there that are in homes with unlocked and loaded guns. And not only does this pose a risk for unintentional shootings, but also intentional shootings. 75% of school shootings are facilitated by the fact that a kid was able to get a gun from his home. And this is something that you know, kids go through heartbreak and disgruntled times and, and frustrations. Easy access to a gun turns those very normal childhood experiences deadly and end family fire is working to prevent that. Next slide. But even more staggering is the fact that access to these unlocked and loaded guns in the home is going to increase the risk of a suicide death by almost 300%. And so not only is it an unintentional harm, we also have to focus on and be concerned about intentional harm. And these are really hard conversations to have, but during a pandemic, they're even more important to have. When you have kids that are, are home from school more often while parents are working and having split attention. When you have kids that are uncertain about their, their future, they don't know if they're going to be going off to college or if college is going to happen, if they're going to have a job market when it's done. They're in more stress because they haven't seen their friends for a long time. So there's all of these compound factors that are now weighing on our young people and coupled with the fact that we've seen record gun sales um, over the course of the pandemic. So new guns in homes where you have kids that are under more and more stress, this is a potential horrible recipe for disaster. Next slide, please. So what can you actually do about it? End Family Fire has created a vehicle to have these really hard conversations. And first, way we are doing this is by putting it in context of a mass shooting. Every day, 63 people on average die by gun suicide. And that is more people than in a, one of our most deadliest mass shootings that we have, have ever, ever had. You know, we don't, we don't talk about it in that context. We look at these as isolated incidents. So our hope is to bring the conversation into broader focus, talk about the totality of this to, to put a, you know, a face and a name on that these aren't one-off isolated incidences, but two-thirds of our deaths and our epidemic that we really need to be talking about. Next slide. Uh, can you play the... All right, I'm in the house. Okay, uh, what do you see? Nothing yet. Hold on, I think I just heard something. I'm heading upstairs. Okay, I am almost there. I'm in the bedroom. Okay. Oh, shit. It's not here. What? The gun's not here. What? What do you mean? Where is it? Cam. Cameron? Are you in there? Open the door. Cam! Come on, Cam. Cameron. Now, I know this is incredibly hard to watch, and it's something that even working through and developing it is hard for me to watch every single time that I... I do, but it is a incredibly important vehicle for conversation right now that is there. It is a vehicle for, for change. Um, we know through the End Family Fire program that the emotionally focused language that is a part of this, the relatability to family focused situations, both for this one, as well as I'm sure many of you have seen the Justin video, is a catalyst for real change of behavior because it puts people in the shoes of this could actually happen to me. We know the biggest disconnect out there is the fact that people often fear that like, oh, this, this would never happen. This is other people's problems because we haven't normalized it. Our goal here is to engage gun owners to ask or not owners or non-gun owners and gun owners like to ask about guns that are in the home. Even if you're a gun owner, ask, set the example to act through safe storage and, uh, and practicing that in your own homes. Talk, talk with your friends and your families and loved ones about whether or not you're choosing to get a gun, why you might be getting a gun, how you plan on storing that gun. And then most importantly, learn. Learn about what 
what actions and what policies exist in your area. And Pelly's going to talk a lot more about those um, for California. But ask, act, talk, and learn are the key tenets that we can take away here. Next slide, please. And during COVID-19, it is absolutely crucial. So I'm just going to foot stomp a few quick things here in saying that we know that gun sales have spiked. And anecdotally, these are a lot of first-time gun owners that are out there. And these first-time gun owners don't have access to a lot of the tools, the, the trainings, the groups that normally they'd go and learn about their safe, like safe storage techniques and opportunities. They are often isolated. And there has been a increase in gun violence as a result. There's increased fear plus increased access to guns is resulting in increased violence. And so it's really more vital than ever that we're reaching out to people in their homes where they are to communicate how safe storage can actually effectively reduce the likelihood of both unintentional and intentional strategies or tragedies that are, that are there. And when we think about why this person-to-person -person message is so important, is that there are only 11 states out there with actual laws around this. And so this is really about individual education and empowerment to act in the right way. With more kids at home, as I noted, more schools remains closed, more just stress from economic uncertainty, more stress coming into this current political environment, um, more division, talks of inciting violence on the news, Having that person-to-person -person conversation, engaging in those safe storage conversations becomes important because policymakers aren't always acting as fast as we want them to. So we need to go out there and be water carriers and champions in a way that we know is going to change uh, behavior and save lives. Next slide. And so for all of you, we really empower you to help amplify this message or implore you to do it. You, if you go to nfamilyfire.org, there are toolkits there for you to get the ad put out in your local community. Um, right now with so many people at home, social media and these platforms are being used more and more. So there's so much more opportunity to get the message out there uh, because this is how people are, are communicating. Um, please reach out to me if you're looking for more ways to do this because I would love to uh, engage with you on it. I don't know if we've got any of our Florida folks on the line too, but they just had great billboards put up in Sarasota. So huge shout out to them for rallying the community around in areas that are really going to be impacted um, by this message because we know it works. So thank you so much. And I think that's my cue to pass it over to Pelly. Thank you so much, Kai, for that very important message. And um, I will be continuing to talk um, about when guns are in the home because um, safe gun storage is one way and a preferred way to um, prevent preventable gun violence, gun tragedies. Um, but I'm gonna be talking about another. So if you can go to next slide, please. So, Kai alluded to this a little bit, but um, obviously we have guns in our homes. And not only do we have guns in our homes, but there are more guns in the United States, if you don't already know, than there are people in the United States. And specifically in California, where we are right now, before the shelter in place um, from COVID this spring, we know that one in four households in California had a gun. And we also know and we understand now that since shelter in place uh, in March of, two, of this year, um, we've had at least an increase of 64% increase in gun purchases um, over last year. So there is a lot of guns out there and specifically there's a lot of first time gun owners out there. So we, what do we do then? We have so many guns in our homes. How can we ensure that firearms are not misused to commit violence within our homes and our communities? If you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so besides encouraging safe gun storage, which is so important um, and that Kai just spoke of, we've turned to civil remedies to remove firearms from those who, who pose an extreme risk of violence to themselves or others. In California, California is one of 19 states plus, the, plus um, DC, that have added ERPOs or extreme risk protection orders to our toolkit to prevent gun violence. In California, the ERPOs are called gun violence restraining orders and I will be calling them GVROs for the remainder of my presentation. 
Um, and GVROs were put into effect on January 1st, 2016. And like many ERPOs in the country, the genesis of, genesis of GVROs began, unfortunately, in the aftermath of another preventable tragic mass shooting, the 2014 shooting in Isla Vista, California. This was a case in which the gunman had broadcast hate-filled and threatening manifesto to his teachers, to his family, to his friends. His parents had contacted law enforcement. Law enforcement had contacted him. But despite all of that, there were not tools in place or laws in place that allowed for law enforcement or anyone else to remove guns or check for guns um, be, before this horrible tragedy occurred. And hence, another prevention preventable tragedy occurred. So in the wake of Isla Vista, California, the California legislature passed our California's gun violence restraining order law, and it came into effect in 2000, January 1st, 2016. Next slide, please. So there are several laws on the books that permit the temporary removal of firearms when someone poses a threat. GVROs were meant to fill the gaps when those laws may not apply. Julia Weber, is going to be discussing GVROs in context a little bit later in the session, but I just want to frame this a little bit as this is just one tool in a larger toolbox, including safe gun storage. Next slide, please. I just want to remind everyone, if, if you're not familiar, or even if you are, just to remind everybody what a gun violence restraining order can do. Um, it's a civil, it's a court ordered civil procedure that temporarily removes firearms and ammunition and prohibits the purchasing of new firearms and ammunition for 21 days and up to five years as of September 1st, 2020. It's removed from a person who's a danger to themselves or others and has access to firearms. Next slide, please. So I wanna discuss who can obtain a GVRO. We know that people closest to someone often recognizes a crisis before that is active, acted upon. So the law was meant to allow some of these close associates the ability to remove the lethality from a crisis situation. So when GVROs were first um, came into effect in 2016, the people who were able to obtain a GVRO would be immediate family members, roommates, or law enforcement. But since September 1st of this year, we've added teachers, employers, employees, and coworkers to that group. And I think something we, we are gonna need to really consider, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that due to the dangers inherent in the removal of firearms from their owners, law enforcement really needs to be a trusted partner in this process. So we need to make efforts to make sure that that happens. Next slide, please. Whoops, can you animate that for me? Oops. Go back. Can you go back? Thanks. Oops. Can you go back one more? See if that gives me a, ugh, what happened to my graph? Okay, go to the next slide and I'll just talk about it because the graph's not, per, it's not for some reason populating. So what this graph was going to show you <laughs> is that um, there's, there's some things that we do know now. Um, one of the things, um, someone like me who has been working um, with gun violence prevention and the first thing that I kind of took under my belt was to um, work on GVROs. Um, I think it's really important for those of us who are advocates out there to make sure we understand, you know, how is the implementation going and how can look at kind of how it's going and consider how we can possibly improve that as we move forward. So what this slide was going to show you is that in 2016, we had very few GVROs that were issued. And they started to be um, uh, issued more frequently in fall of 2018 and increased until uh, through 2019. And there's a couple of reasons why that happened. So what you can't see here is that there's a 900% increase in the use of, um, or, uh, obtaining of GVROs from 2016 through the end of 2019. 
um, with a total of 1,076 that were issued by the end of 2019. One of the reasons, and what this does partially show you, is that um, the San Diego City Attorney's Office decided to take it upon themselves to really emphasize the use of gun violence restraining orders as a way of preventing gun violence in their communities. Um, so they started training their own police officers in the fall of 2018, and then were able to get some grant funding to start training other law enforcement agencies across the state. Um, I've been told by San Diego that as of now, the present, they've trained law enforcement agencies across 95% of the counties in California. So that's something that's really um, a positive thing that we've, we've accomplished, but there's more work that we need to do. So next slide, please. So let's talk about the petitioners for the GVRO. We told you, I told you that um, law enforcement was allowed to obtain them, immediate family members and roommates. As you can kind of see from this slide, what we found, and this is through the um, research at UC, the UC Davis um, uh, Violence Prevention Center, Research um, Center, they have done a study from uh, looking at GVROs issued from January 1st, 2016 through the end of 2019. And what they found is that despite the fact that we have a panoply of people who can obtain the GVROs, that primarily at the moment, or so far, that law enforcement has been the primary initiator of GVROs. 96, almost 97% of them have been obtained by law enforcement. So there may be a few reasons why that is. One, we, as we've talked about before, there's been more training put forward forth to law enforcement about gun violence restraining orders. But there may be some other reasons. Um, and I think those are things we're going to want to be exploring as advocates. Um, it's also one of the possibilities is that many people, although not all people, turn to 911 as in crisis and that law enforcement is usually the first responders in those situations. So they may be the first ones to access the information that would um, allow them to obtain a GVRO. Next slide, please. Um, so let's turn to, I wanna to turn to some situations where the GVRO has been issued um, and, and an incident, a crisis has been averted, fortunately. Um, so specifically, it's been used to prevent suicide in several, circum several circumstances. Um, I'm gonna give you a few examples, real life examples. In one situation, we have a person who admitted that they were depressed and called someone they knew and told them they were depressed and that they wanted to shoot themselves. That person got a hold of law enforcement and told them the situation and that the person was um, driving around in a car with a gun with them. Um, the police officers were able to contact the person in the car and were able to, um, once they got the GVRO, were able to remove the weapon and actually the weapon was surrendered um, by the person who was uh, thinking about committing suicide. And it's thankful that they did because when they removed the weapon, it was loaded and, it, and a um, round was in the chambers. So in that case, uh, a horrible crisis was averted using a GVRO. There's another circumstance where law enforcement, um, it's, uh, let me back up. <laughs> so it's also being used to prevent mass shootings, which is where we started in the first place with um, gun violence restraining orders. Um, there's been, there was a situation where um, a potential school shooter had been posting about um, possibly being a, you know, shooting up a school and had posted photos of himself on, on Facebook and other social media with an AK-47, had also had racist posts, a lot of hate-filled posts, um, and had been accused of killing animals at school. So in that case, a GVRO was issued and thankfully firearm was removed and a crisis again was averted. Another situation that prevented a mass shooting was a GVR was used to recover a semi-automatic rifle from a man who praised a recent mass shooter and made threats to bring his gun to work. Again, a GVR was issued and a crisis was averted. A situation that um, I know I would say I wasn't 
um, I, I hadn't thought of when I was first thought about GVROs, but was a situation I'm about to tell you about. And almost all of us could see ourselves potentially in this situation. Um, this was a situation where a family arrived at their grandpa's house for Thanksgiving, thinking that this is gonna be a wonderful Thanksgiving and they approached the door and grandpa came to the door pointing a loaded rifle at them. Unfortunately, due to grandpa's dementia, he did not recognize his family. Um, fortunately, the family was able to um, get a GVRO and um, the rifle was removed and um, grandpa was not able to cause harm to his family even though he couldn't recognize him. Uh, it was also issued in a case where a man had dementia to the point where he threatened to shoot his wife and his neighbor because he falsely thought that they were having an affair due to his delusions um, due to dementia. So again, this was a situation where they were able to obtain a GVRO. It was also obtained, um, it also can be used to um, take a gun away from someone who has, who's recklessly using it. Someone who isn't safely storing it, who's, who's not shooting at a shooting range or, or hunting with it. But in this case, a neighbor was shooting um, into his neighbor's backyard and uh, police were called, the police arrived, heard shots um, going on. And when they contacted the person with the gun, he said he thought that he was shooting rodents in his neighbor's backyard to you know, prevent rodents. And um, it turned out his very, very high blood alcohol level. And thankfully the gun was able to be removed once a GVR was issued. Next slide, please. So I want to circle back, back to the mass shootings. Um, the incidents I just told you about were are anecdotal. They are real incidents. Um, but this is a situation where I'm going to talk about where we actually have some data. This is another um, study that UC Davis was able to do that tried to see whether or not GVROs have been effective in preventing mass shootings. So from 2016 through 2019, they studied um, uh, 21 mass shooting threats in which 21 GVROs were issued. And in those situations, not only were the firearms removed, but in some circumstances, they were, the people were prevented from actually purchasing um, firearms, which also is an indicator that background checks work because the GVROs were in the system and prevented people from purchasing firearms. They continue to follow those respondents or the people who who's had GVROs issued against them through the end of 2019. And they found that no violent incidents happened, um, that none of those individuals were involved in any mass shootings or violent incidents once that GVRO was issued. So it does appear that GVROs can be effective in preventing mass shootings when people are aware of crisis situations of loved ones, friends, um, coworkers, so on. Um, again, as I think Kai talked about, if you, you know, Ask and if you hear something, um, you can do something about it now. Um, so next slide, please. Before we go to, um, oh my goodness, why is this not broadcasting? Can you see if it will broadcast the rest of that? On the slide, nope, go back. Okay, having a little issue with slides. Okay, <laughs> so before we go on to the, um, move, I, move, I turned it over to Julia and move on to the panel. Um, I think it's really important to talk about um, that given that we now know that law enforcement is extensively involved in the implementation and execution of gun violence restraining orders, um, it's really important that we look at um, how the implementation um, is implemented through a racial justice lens. So what I wanna talk about, and this was supposed to reflect, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, is how does race factor into um, how GVRs are actually being utilized so far. So what, we, what do we know so far? We know that, and this is again through the UC Davis study, that 92% of the respondents or the people were, who had GVROs issued against them were, um, were men, 60% um, of them were white, and generally they were in their mid 40s. And generally, there seemed to be a direct correlation between the race of gun owners and GVR respondents, which would make sense. People who have firearms potentially could have them taken away if there is a crisis situation. 
However, there does appear to be an outlier, and this is where we need to have things we need to consider about how do we move forward with this, is that the outlier does seem to be the black community who are only 4% of the gun owners, nevertheless are 9% of the GVR respondents. So this is a, this is a discrepancy that we're gonna need to consider as we move forward um, in the future implementation of GVROs. I think it's really important that we continue to follow the implementation of the laws that we put in place, especially these really important ones that actually can prevent significant crises, which we've already seen. Um, we wanna make sure they're doing what they're intended, which is preventing preventable firearm deaths. But we also wanna make sure that we can prevent unintended consequences um, of, of our actions and exacerbating racial justice issues. So we will be talking about that in our panel shortly. And I'd like to turn it over to Julia. Thank you so much, Haley. And um, we'll just get the slides set up here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join this discussion and congratulations on pulling together such a great conference. And um, why don't we move to the first slide, please? That should be next. So um, just to uh, help put uh, some of this in context, which I've been asked to do, um, in my capacity, I am an attorney, social worker, do training, um, teach domestic violence law in San Francisco, um, do a lot of training on these topics. I began working on implementation e efforts um, in my role with the Judicial Council, which is the policy making body for the state courts in California. So we worked with all 58 counties on um, drafting legislation and implementing legislation. So when the gun violence restraining order was uh, being advocated for and eventually uh, went into effect, part of my job was to help place it into context, develop rules, forms, protocols um, at the local level in the 58 counties and with our uh, judiciary uh, throughout the state on what it means, how it all works. Um, and now in my implementation director role with Giffords, I, I continue that, that effort. And I also do some consulting with UC Davis um, on these topics. So I'm a proponent of taking um, an expansive approach to considering how we can best prevent firearms, violence in homes and within families. Um, and domestic violence certainly has received some increased attention during the pandemic. Um, it, we've seen concerns about isolation, economic instability, stress, increases in gun purchases, as has already been mentioned. All of that come, all of those factors come into play. They're all um, risk factors uh, for those who are already being harmed by family members and dating partners. Um, so when we talk about uh, firearms violence in the home, especially suicide, but also injury, also the chaos of domestic violence, we have to be talking about intimate partner violence. And um, so it's critical to sort of get into the weeds a bit on that topic. And it's a complex one. Like I said, I've been, I've been working on it for you know, a couple of decades now, and um, I'm in the middle of teaching, as I do in the fall, a semester on domestic violence law. And it's always, um, you know, very complex, very difficult. Um, it's uh, so prevalent, so many people have experiences of domestic violence. And so um, often the expectation is that we push it aside and not talk about it, that um, that in and of itself brings up a variety of issues. Um, we know domestic violence shows up not just with severe injuries. We, we know there's over a million women alive today who have been shot or shot at by male partners. Um, and it shows up with lethality, but it also shows up um, with coercion. So if you could just click on the quote here from the National Domestic Violence Hotline, um, which had long before the pandemic, um, been, they'd been reporting an increase in calls to the National Domestic Violence Hotline uh, that involved firearms. So we've seen an increase there and um, even more significant reports of that connection during the pandemic, which is of course of enormous concern. There's some debate about whether domestic violence has increased or not during the pandemic. It's hard to know. We don't do an adequate job collecting that data. Um, I bring this up for a number of reasons. Obviously, it's related to the topic we're talking about, but also because it's my firm belief that the domestic violence movement, the battered women's movement, um, has a lot to offer us in the gun violence prevention movement around the priority they have placed for a long time now on safety planning. 
So in the domestic violence world, we know that restraining orders are one tool available to us. Um, and firearm prohibiting restraining orders have been available for domestic violence for a long time. So the gun violence res uh, restraining order did not uh, add another remedy specifically for domestic violence um, in terms of addressing domestic violence behaviors, although uh, some law enforcement folks have seen this as an opportunity to remove firearms in situations where a victim survivor may not be pursuing a restraining order. Um, and that has its own levels of complexity uh, because it may be that a reliance on a GVRO can increase risk for victims of domestic violence. Um, and we may want to be asking whether or not decisions are being made to avoid the criminal route for good reasons or for problematic reasons. So there's still a lot of open questions about some of the research, the numbers that are coming in, a lot more to learn on that. We also know the firearms prohibitions had not been fully implemented. Um, if you would please go to the next slide. Um, here we have a chart, it's probably too tiny for you to see, but I, trust me, it's available publicly. This is from the uh, California Bureau of Firearms. Every year they're required to release a report to the legislature uh, that talks about how successful they have been at obtaining firearms from prohibited persons. So the armed prohibited persons um, unit is responsible for um, tracking those uh, numbers. We're the only state in the country here in California that has the ability to look at the numbers of folks who are uh, known firearm owners and are also um, under a prohibition. And um, we still have according to the state records, over 20,000 people possibly who are prohibited for a variety of reasons, not just domestic violence, not just civil restraining orders, but that is a component of it, and um, who are prohibited and, as far as we know, continue to have possession or ownership of firearms. So um, it's an indication that we need to do a much better job actually implementing those prohibitions. Um, and, just to go back now uh, for a moment, um, that's one of the reasons why safety planning is so important. So if you would um, go ahead and uh, click on the next little tiny chart. Um, okay, so the gun violence restraining order circled here, as has already been mentioned, um, fits into a larger context of civil restraining orders, all of which in California include firearms prohibitions. Some of the differences are, and why the GVRO was necessary, is that all these other restraining orders, domestic violence restraining orders, elder or dependent abuse orders, civil harassment orders, workplace violence prevention orders, and school violence prevention orders, all have an identifiable protected person. The GVRO is the only one that does not have an identifiable protected person. It is similar in that it has a restrained person, the person who is now prohibited. All the others also have that restrained person identified um, and the prohibition in place. Um, but if there are situations in which what we're trying to do is protect the general public as opposed to an individual. So the GVRO allows us to do that. Um, it does not restrict individual behavior beyond firearms. So it doesn't prevent abuse, harassment, disturbing the peace. Um, and it doesn't provide for all of the other remedies designed to reduce domestic violence, um, financial support, child support, parenting arrangements, pet protection, um, so, uh, cell phone uh, contracts that can be transferred under the DVRO, um, and other remedies that are available. So it's a very narrow tool, an important one that fills a gap, um, but it's one that people should consider um, with great thought, care, with the assistance of an advocate, and ideally with legal advice or at the le very least legal information. So I suspect that we will always see the GVRO numbers and ERPO's numbers generally not being extraordinarily high. And um, I uh, am a proponent of really thinking carefully be about how we measure success of this policy. And I am, um, not a fan of measuring success by counting the number of GVROs, uh, in part because high numbers, for example, of mass incarceration, um, don't necessarily tell us that we are addressing criminal activity so much as it's an indication that we have some issues around disproportionate representation in the criminal justice system. And so similarly, we want to be very thoughtful about 
um, how we look at implementation of GVROs. You know, we also have alternatives here that focus on mental health issues. And what I've seen in the 58 counties are um, a significant amount of diversity in terms of which tools are most popular, which approach makes the most sense given how they proceed with law enforcement and other community-based interventions. Um, so I want to raise that as an, as an issue. Um, the next, if you would just uh, click on the next piece here, um, I, I want to note, has, as has already been mentioned, um, the issue with uh, racism, communities of color, and the relationship with police is a complex one and one that a greater number of Americans are becoming more familiar with um, during the uprising and the attention that's been paid to the issue uh, since uh, George Floyd's murder earlier this year. Um, this statistic tells us a lot about uh, the experience that all too many communities of color, people of color have had with law enforcement. And so within the context of domestic violence and in the context of other forms of potential firearms violence, uh, including suicide, for example, the notion that calling police or police intervention would be a safer approach is one that does not universally make sense. So police are not perceived as promoting safety and offering protection, instead often being seen instead as another source of violence. And so when we see numbers that 97% of GVROs in California are being obtained by law enforcement, that could be reflective of part of the problem, which is both uh, over-policing is one issue around racism, and another one is under-policing. So in communities where the GVRO is not being used, is anything being done at all to prevent suicide, for example, which is a great concern, um, especially for young men of color? Um, or is, uh, are they pursuing criminal routes instead? Um, and I've heard that very issue raised that, you know, we're not being racist because uh, so many of, you know, 60% of the re restrained folks that we have numbers on are white folks. Well, I think we have to dig a little bit more deeply into what's really going on there. Um, and then I'll just uh, close uh, my piece here and we can move to the panel with just a note, if you would please click on the next little tiny image that we have tools available for advocates. Brady, of course, has tools available for advocates within Giffords Law Center. We've created two tools. Um, you can just click, I think, one more time. One is uh, this brochure available in Spanish and English that um, we think really tries to address the range of options. It might be calling 911 when you're talking about imminent harm. It might be um, talking about appropriate um, transfer or sale of firearms or safe storage. It may be getting in touch with a community-based organization. Um, and then specifically for advocates, we have a checklist for implementation. And in order to address these kinds of issues that the policies we develop be um, sort of more focused on safety planning and making careful choices about which tool to choose as we develop policies with an equity lens. And as we implement policies, we want to have diverse uh, voices at the table. And we want to really think broadly about all the different ways we can implement this, how we measure success is critical. And the um, advocate uh, role in terms of the implementation checklist is really critical. So that's a, a fillable PDF that's available. Um, and I should say the brochure that is California specific, we're developing a template that can be used in other jurisdictions as well. Um, and so hopefully that provides some context and I will turn it over to you, Bailey, for our panel discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much, Julia and Kai. Um, I'd like to everyone to unmute themselves and we can, um, we can uh, close the pr presentation um, part of it. Thank you so much. We're gonna move on to our panel and I think Julia um, started this discussion. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Christian first. Um, we were talking about and um, noticing that there are, um, with both with GBROs and other issues when law enforcement are involved, we wanna, talk about how can we incorporate these racial, racial justice concerns into our implementation of these really important um, policies, both safe gun storage and temporary removal um, of firearm policies. Christian? Yeah, it's, no, I mean, it's, it's a great question. It's a vitally important question. And as has been stated a couple times, right, it's, it's something we really need to um, continue to keep a really close 
eye on and, and to ensure that these tools are used um, as they are intended, right? Um, I, you know, I, I can tell you just from, from my history, we, uh, I did spend some time developing um, this tool in California in 2015. I worked alongside a number of people uh, at Brady. I was at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence at the time and, and have worked on it in, in all the states where this passed since. Um, and, and one of the things that's important to recognize is this tool is really formed uh, in, a, in, in an image to try to make sure that there is not, uh, that it is not misused by law enforcement, right? Um, it, it is not a secret that this was formed after the domestic violence uh, procedures that, um, that Julie laid out so, so clearly that we um, tried to put together a civil process that um, used all the leading evidence and epidemiology around risk, behavioral risk in particular. One of the big concerns while developing this is also um, just how often wrong we are about the way that we associate mental illness with dangerousness. And, and what this tool really did is it looked at the evidence, you know, a lot of the evidence that did come through and out of UC Davis, out of um, uh, Harvard and, and Johns Hopkins about you know, how do we predict acts of violence? How do we have a tool to prevent acts of violence before they occur? Because so often our gun laws are reactive. Um, and how do we do so without creating new avenues of criminality that lead um, to the ongoing over-incarceration, especially of young black men um, in this country? And, and so this tool was developed to, to try to take all of these different pieces and put them together and um, and, and, and really what we saw in its use, and, and it, it's built after um, the successful use in, of, of a tool in Connecticut, uh, a risk warrant law, is, is first and foremost um, that this tool is a suicide prevention tool. Um, and and Pelly, your, your presentation really dove in, I thought, um, effectively at, at and, and even what Julia is talking about, really the GVR was designed to fill these gaps, right? We've got um, uh, emergency hospitalizations and 5150s in California that um, uh, allow people to be prohibited from uh, purchase and possession. We've got, um, uh, when somebody breaks a law, we've got a list of prohibitions on, on violent and, and other types of acts. Um, what we don't necessarily have is how do we solve that, that, that problem of somebody like an Isla Vista, the shooter who, whose parents just called police and said, I'm really worried my son's gonna do something. Police went there, he didn't fit the criteria for an involuntary commitment and he owned weapons and there's nothing law enforcement could do. Uh, how do we remove firearms from that situation um, without necessarily forever altering people's lives? Um, and the gun violence restraining order attempted to tackle all these problems. We need to keep making sure that uh, a tool that law enforcement is using so heavily in a place like California is not being abused. I will say in places like, like Maryland, we're seeing uh, the use is, is very different, right? a majority of respondents in places like Maryland are actually, because um, I know that there's people coming from all over the country to view, the, view this, uh, this webinar, um, a lot of those petitioners are family members, which is another important aspect when we think about racial disparity too, is we know that law enforcement can't be the first people um, that everyone can call because not everybody can feel safe when they're calling law enforcement. So it's very intentional that uh, this tool has been developed in a way that family members can call um, that they can petition the court directly, that they can make sure that their loved one is not at risk of harming themselves or others, and that they can um, step in and protect them. I'll, I'll leave one, one story real quick that sort of highlights this. Um, King County, Washington is, is a district that um, is doing this incredibly well. They have a firearm removal task force um, in Washington that is, has just become incredible at, at, at making sure they're doing everything. And, and they couple, uh, you know, they don't couple them. They what they do is they, they're tasked with removing firearms for people who are at risk. So when somebody comes in for a domestic violence restraining order in that, that procedure, they're making sure that that implementation of, of removing the gun is happening, right? The same thing with these GVROs. Um, at one point, somebody came up and, and it was a girlfriend who was trying to petition the court for a gun violence restraining order against her boyfriend. Um, everybody thought they knew what the story was gonna look like. They were, they were confused that it was this tool that she was invoking. And um, they actually came up to petition the court together. Uh, they were holding hands and she said, I'm, I'm petitioning the court to get this uh, extreme risk order um, to save my boyfriend's life, um, who was experiencing severe suicidal ideation. Um, they came there together to save his life, to prevent him from harming himself. And that's really what we're trying to do. There was no other tool available to them to make that happen. 
And I think that when the tool is being used its best and when, and when it has been studied, right, um, in places like Connecticut, for every 10 to 20 orders that were issued, at least one life was saved, at least one suicide was averted. Um, so this is a really important tool that does fill these gaps. I just want to give one shout out because I know we're running out of time and, and this might be the only time I get a chance to talk. Um, we have all, a lot of the groups, especially in California, you have a very unique resource available to you to talk about the gun violence restraining order. It's a website called speakforsafety.org. If you go to www.speakforsafety.org. And, and even though these, these policies have changed, um, it has recently been updated with, um, with all the um, uh, advances and, and changes that Kelly walked through that the legislature has, has put in and were implemented in September this year. I really urge folks to jump in there. It, it has um, specific resources for specific groups so that you can give information. It's got uh, pamphlets and brochures. It helps walk through what the procedures look like. And it gives you the ability to sort of best understand in a non-intimidating way how you can access this process, um, what exactly um, it entails, what it looks like, and how everybody from law enforcement to um, elder care officials to uh, family members can uh, get involved in this process, see if, the, if, if this GVRO is right to protect you and your loved ones. Um, so I, I urge everybody to look at www.speakforsafety.org. And if you have any questions, um, always feel free to reach out to us at Brady. It's something that's um, really important to all of us. Thank you, Christian. I'm gonna, so we are running out of time. I just wanna do a quick shout out. Um, if, for those of you who can see in the chat, we've um, posted the speakforsafety.org. I think that answers one of my next questions, which is, how can the people on this call and volunteer advocates um, support the gun violence prevention measures we've talked about today? Um, so one of them is to go to speakforsafety.org and make yourself familiar with that issue. Um, and Julia has provided um, the brochure that she talked about and her, um, her uh, chart about the various different restraining orders in California. They're both in the chat. So you can download, take those links and take a look at them. I'm gonna give each of you 30 seconds <laughs> to just quickly say, I think Christian's talked about it, but um, Kai um, and Julia, uh, just how, is there some other thing that, that the, the people on the call can do today to support the measures that we've talked about today? Kai, real quickly. Yeah, I think the biggest, uh, endfamilyfire.org, and there is a link to the End Family Fire Toolkit there, which actually has some um, how-to instructions for getting this placed on social media, digital media, traditional media as well. I know that's there to um, be able to, to use this tool to get out there. Perfect. And Julia? Sure, I would just quickly say that I, I really want to emphasize safety planning. These can be very risky cases. Obtaining a GVRO can itself increase risk. And so I, I want to highlight the importance of going to the, in California, the Judicial Council website that has a whole section on safety planning where people can get information from self-help centers that are based at courts. The National Domestic Violence Hotline also has excellent information on safety planning that can be utilized not just in domestic violence cases, but to think very carefully about which remedy is the best one. And I, I'm a strong proponent of avoiding promoting one remedy over another. It could be a criminal route we need to go. It could be a civil restraining order. It could be domestic violence restraining order. It could be safe storage. And I think um, we need to really be careful. As advocates, we have to advocate for these policies. And then once they're passed, we have to think carefully be about how they're implemented um, so that we don't overstate the importance of one remedy over another and inadvertently create risks and problems around implementation. So I encourage folks to check out safety planning resources. I'd love to see the gun violence prevention movement focus even more on that issue um, and all of these tools be available within that context. So thank you. Right. Thanks, Julia. Um, we are running out of time. So I just want everyone look at the chat. There's links to almost everything we talked about here today. Uh, speak for safety and family fire, the, civil, the restraint order chart and um, the Gippers brochure. So thank you, Christian and Kai and Julia for joining me in this um, session. And I appreciate your expertise and um, hopefully all of you had got something out of this um, today and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Take care thank everyone. You. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.